people and all that stuff. And uh, I actually I talked, I spoke to Mark Capani a few days ago, and I obviously wanted to speak to you a little bit about it. Um, uh, How's he doing? I, What's he doing? I, I haven't talked to him in years. He's doing great. Actually, that was one of the things he brought up is that he wished that uh, you two had kept in touch a little more, but because of uh, obviously wrestling and he's a vice principal now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the feature. It's because, you know, you guys were in like a main event angle, and then all of a sudden he's gone in his mid-20s and never in wrestling again. It's You never hear of that. You just never, ever hear of that, and I thought that was pretty fascinating. Uh, yeah, it, it was really weird. I mean, not simply mm-hmm. weird. It was just very – Mark had a very specific idea of what he wanted to do, and when they told him that he couldn't do it anymore. He just had no desire of, of being involved in the industry if he couldn't do what, what his vision was. Yeah, and I thought that with – I thought it was kind of a weird contrast because, you know, 11 years ago we had a thing where you all were in that angle, and because of the unfortunate timing of one of the angles is pulled off TV, now we have a guy like Donald Trump basically promoting racism on TV, and not only does he do it, but he's advocated for it, and I thought that was I thought that was super weird. But uh, when when you see like a guy like Donald Trump saying the things that he say, says, how does that make a person like you feel? I mean, it's, it affects me more as an entertainer than it does as a person because the way I see it is this: he's doing whatever he has to do to garner eyeballs, and that's the thing that we've done in wrestling all the time. Is that we make freak show attractions, we have, you know, live sex shows and weird things like that, just whatever you have to do to garner eyeballs, and I think that's all he's doing right now. I, I have a hard time depicting what are his actual feelings and what are the things that he feels he needs to say to get an audience. But um, as a person, it doesn't bother me at all because it lays it in my head. I'm coming at it like a showman, and I'm just saying he's just doing whatever he has to do. Like if we were in a different country or a you know, more tolerant place of, of Middle Easterners and foreigners like Canada, for example, I got a feeling he wouldn't be saying any of this stuff. Uh, because he knows it's not what's going to attract eyeballs to him. He'd probably be promoting hockey or something regarding whatever, you know, something else, whatever would get uh, people's yeah. attention. So I, I, whether or not there's a genuine feeling, I don't know. I feel like they're not. I feel like he's just saying whatever it is he has to say to gain traction in the United States. It's funny because my rough draft of the feature, the way I opened it, I opened it with a, with one of his quotes, and I said I guess it should be no surprise that he is a WWE Hall of Famer because he's a performer and a businessman before anything. Yeah, and for sure. That seems that seems to be the way that he's going. Uh, I remember in uh, a shoot interview, you said you talked about all the heat that, uh, that that Mark got. Did you ever get any of that heat, or were you pretty much exempt from it? No, I was I was pretty much exempt from it because I wasn't a threat to anybody. You know, Mark was Mark was a big threat to a lot of people. He was in great shape. Vince loved him. He was like the hottest heel on the show. Like one of the hottest. I shouldn't even say heel. He was one of the hottest characters on the show. So all the people that fuck with him were people that were were kind of threatened. Their positions were threatened, or their jobs were on the or not just their jobs, but their positions on the card were threatened, and they were going to be bumped down the card to make room for guys like Muhammad. And I was just you know the manager at the time, so I wasn't a threat to anybody at all. It, you know they, you know Bradshaw wasn't going to move four or five spots down the the card from the main event because I was there. But he did move down a few spots because they were going to put Mark in the SmackDown main event, um, you know, or someone like Bob Holly wasn't going to be on the house shows anymore because there's only room for seven talents. But, and you know, maybe Mark is a new talent that comes on that bumps him off the bottom of the card. Like those guys legitimately had worries and concerns, and they're the ones that fucked with them the most. So I mean, I, I remember now, and, and when I talked to, to Mark about it, the, the Kurt Angle uh, Eddie Guerrero thing, which he said. He wasn't sure if Angle meant it as a rib or was serious because, you know, the the classic Guerrero temper. You never know how Eddie Guerrero is going to react to something like that. Uh, did you think that it was like Angle like seriously trying to give him advice, like you need to protect your finish, or did you think maybe it was a rib? No, I, I think it was 100% serious, and I got really close with Kurt. You know, I, I managed him like a year later, and then like in, in TNA, we used to travel together all the time and getting to know his personality. He has a really hard time uh, depict. he doesn't. He doesn't. It's almost like saying he's like I don't want to use the word racist, but he's like, like prejudice is the right word. He has zero prejudice to the guy in match one and zero prejudice to the guy in the main event. So he just feels whatever is best for business is what he does. 
Uh, like there was one pay per view I think he put over Jay Lethal, which like was something that was huge for Jay yeah. at the time, and Kurt had no problem with it whatsoever. He was just doing what's best for business, and and he held no prejudice against it, or never said, "Hey, I'm a main event guy. Why am I putting this match one guy over?" And he did the same thing for Mark Finish. He was just giving him legitimate advice, that, and it's, it was good advice that he doesn't need to protect his finish, whether or not Mark went along the right way, or whether or not. The advice was, you know, he should have just bit the bullet and, and found a new move or let Eddie do it and him not talk about it. M- maybe one of those would have been a better option for him, but I don't think at any point Kurt was kind of laughing and chuckling to himself, thinking that, oh, I got this motherfucker. That would have been a pretty good rib, though. I, I mean, been, yeah. or maybe, maybe a ruthless one. Tell Eddie Guerrero that he can't use a move that his dad invented. Uh, but, um, I mean, you two were in main – like. Looking back, it's it's remarkable to see how quickly you two were in a main event slot. You all debuted, and then three months later, you're working a WrestleMania segment with Hulk Hogan. Uh, did, what kind of expectations did you have going into that gimmick? Did you know it was going to go that quick? No, I, I, I had no idea how it was going to take off, and it kind of was a – what's the word I'm looking for? It, it was – it really put on blinders in my eyes because I just assumed that was everybody's experience. I just assumed you got to WWE and then you were like, you were part of the show and then you went on to main events and WrestleMania and win belts and stuff because that's how our journey happened. And just in my head, that just kind of was the journey that people took. And then it wasn't until later down the road, I figured out, Oh no, this is like, you know, something that's really special for us. And it doesn't happen to a lot of people. There's a lot of people that, come in from developmental last a couple of weeks and then they're fired or they come in and they spin in their wheels for years and years doing nothing special. You know, like, you know, someone like who's an amazing talent, like, you know, Paul London, for example, he signed with the company, came in and then he didn't leave a lot for like a year. And it's like in my head, just what we did was kind of a natural path. And then later on I realized, Oh no, we're, we're a part of something really special. Like this isn't your everyday kind of stuff. So do you think that, that Mark brought any of that heat on himself, or was it all just like completely uncalled for? Uh, I'll tell you, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know the answer to that question, but I'll say if, if Mark debuted any time in the last five years or in this like TV, PG era, whenever that started, if he started any time at that point on, nobody would have bothered him and probably would have had support from the locker room uh, instead of them fearing that he's going to take something away from them. It, it really was, we were really a, a bad, it was really just a bad time. Everything was in transition. The Attitude Era was, I mean, it wasn't even called the Attitude Era then. It was just the past few years. Like the past few years were winding down. Business was winding down. Everything was slowing. People were getting cut. Like um, kind of Jim Ross just got replaced from talent relations with Johnny Ace. And then like WCW is officially out of business. ECW is officially out of business. Everything was really transitional at that time. Uh, and then the dust settled from that period of time, like right around 2009, 2010. And then this kind of new era we're in of wrestling, people are friends, people help each other. There's not much backstabbing in the locker room. The support system moves in with each other. And that's a place where, you know, not that Mark wasn't thriving where he was, but he could have thrived even that much more today. Yeah, I remember you saying in, in that interview that, you went back and worked a dark match just maybe five years later, and it was completely different, and that you thought that he would be a multimillionaire if he had debuted in a different time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you were obviously a big, big part of that, and, I mean, when they pulled you off TV, how did you feel? Did you see it coming? What was your reaction? No, and both me and Mark were kind of blindsided by it because, like you said, the the deal was so hot and we were so good, and we were aware that we were one of the hotter segments on the show, and we were aware that like main event baby faces all wanted to work with us because we were so hot. And when um, Vince pulled us aside and said he's going to just pull the plug on the thing, we we're just like, really, like just just kill it, like you have. A cash cow here. You're not just going to let these things die down, or maybe pull us off TV for a while and bring it back. And he was just adamant about, nope, like the Muhammad Hassan character is dead. We're not going to do it anymore. It's over. It's done with. And then he mentioned repackaging us and bring us back as, as possibly different characters down the road. And then that was one of the things where Mark wasn't, he wasn't on board with that. He knew that the money that Muhammad Hassan could make and could draw, um, 
you know, was was there, was still there, and was great thing, and it was just a product of bad timing. And I feel, and maybe to tell me, I don't know, I haven't talked to him in a long time. I feel like he felt like he wasn't going to come back and do something less than or not as good as what he was doing before. Yeah, I was. I think I maybe talked to Shane Helms before an interview I did with him, and he said it's really hard to run a Muhammad Hassan character that was at the top of the card and was working with Hulk Hogan, then repackage them and come back as something else. It's really hard yeah. to do that. Uh, yeah, what were you to repackage failures? It's really hard to repackage successes. Well, what were your thoughts when he just said, "You know what? I'm not coming back." Yeah. I... It was, it was one of those things where I kind of just like respected his decision because we were we were really good friends. A lot of people are your, your colleagues, and some people are your friends. And like I said, a lot a lot of people I just work with. But I have a handful of, of friends that were I was traveling with, and that was you know like Masters, Carlito, Hurricane, and and Mark was one of them. Uh, and he was always my friend. So whatever decision he made, like I was uh, I was okay, man. If you feel like that's best, that's best for you. And and I still thought and he was living in Los Angeles at the time, and then. And so until he got back, moved back to New York, I would still regularly see him. We'd hang out, we'd talk on the phone and text. And and then, like like you said, when you're not in the business, it's quick to lose a touch with each other. So it's like those guys I just mentioned, like Chris Masters. I'll probably see him seven or eight times a year on independent shows randomly here and there. But, you know, those, those type of days with Mark were no longer happening. I, I never was able to bump to him on independent shows three or four times a year. And, I brought him to an autograph so many one time in New York. That was the only appearance he ever done inside of WWE, and and he didn't like it. He was just kind of like, you know, it was cool, whatever, money was fine, but it's not. It said it wasn't. It was nothing glamorous and spectacular, and it wasn't big money like WWE. Even even when I went to TNA, I talked to him a little bit about maybe doing something in TNA, and he was just like, just doing something that wasn't as big and as good and glamorous. WWE stage and the money WWE had and the exposure WWE had and the position he was, he just wasn't interested in taking a step backwards. Uh, are you surprised that WWE didn't like let the heat die down even after the release and maybe say, hey, let's rekindle this gimmick that was arguably the hottest thing that year? I, they don't. They don't sell anything, man. Like if if they make, well, I don't know if it's a right decision, wrong decision, good decision, bad decision, but they don't. They don't sell shit. Like, if they make a decision, they stick to it. And that's, that's the Vince McMahon thing. Like, he's, whatever decision he makes, he's standing behind it. I think he's, it's showing weakness to backtrack or, or, or to, you know, say something that you previously said. Maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of got a feeling that might be the way they operate over there. And to be honest, the truth about WWE is they don't need anybody. They don't even need John Cena. Like, it's a it's a big machine that just kind of moves on its own. It's a perpetual machine. So although John Cena brings in a ton of money and Steve Austin brings in a ton of money and The Rock and, and Muhammad Hassan, they can bring in a ton of money. Like without them, they're fine. They've survived. Their biggest star ever, Hogan left and they were flying. Their biggest star ever, Steve Austin left and they were flying. And then John Cena's taking time off and they were flying. Like unfortunately, it's not like the old olden days where a guy on the top of the corner can see that really hurt business. It, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. Now it's four, five, six people all left at the same time on main event players. And if you can see that, it's, it's hurting the product a little bit. But one guy can make a difference. Stone Cold said this thing one time where he said, it's like a big machine with a bunch of tears and cogs inside it. And then once one cog is worn out, you can just pick it away, throw it out, put in a new cog, and the machine keeps going. And that's kind of how big and successful WWE is, because they're they're a product, they're a brand. It's not it's not up to a talent anymore to draw the house. Um, I I did a lot of research for this article, and one of the, I, I watched all the old vignettes, and one of the things I noticed is how carefully crafted they were. They yeah. started out, and the first one was not threatening in the least, and then yeah. with each with each show, they got a little more aggressive. Until you know you all, until Muhammad Hassan is fighting a sixty-year-old Hall of Famer at the Royal Rumble. How much more devious can you get than than picking on J uh, Jerry Lawler? Uh, how how did you feel when those vignettes came out? Were you happy with them? 
Yeah, I thought I thought they were great, and that was something they hadn't been doing for a while. Like they used to do it for all like debuting talents, whether it was like Mr. Perfect or whoever. They would always like yeah. do these packages on them before they would come in. So by the time they got there, you kind of felt familiar with them, and they hadn't done it for a long time. Uh, and they just started doing it again for some reason. I don't know why. Like they did them for Carlito when he started. I think maybe they did. I'm, I might be wrong, but I thought they did some stuff for Eugene. No, they, so I'm sorry. They did, they did it with Prime stuff. Time too. They had some good ones yeah. with them. Exactly. So they started doing them again. So it was really fun and exciting to be a part of it. And then when we actually did debut on Raw, it, we got a reaction right when we came out because it wasn't like totally unfamiliar faces. Um, and it, they, it was it was something that like I, again I didn't know at the time. I thought that's how everything operated there. My my first experience with there was just what I assumed was the standard. And then, like I said, later I found out that wasn't the case. Uh, I remember for one of our first promos, Stephanie came over with us with a laptop, and she had, like, Microsoft Word open and just a blank page. And she sat down with me and Mark, and she goes, okay, here's what we're doing. This is your first pay-per-view. This is how many weeks it's going to take to get there. What are we going to say tonight? And then we sat, the three of us brainstorming, and, and she was typing, and she wrote out a promo for us as we kind of kicked ideas around, and she'd erase things and edit things and add things. And then finally she had a, a page of, you know, words on a Microsoft Word, printed it out, and there was our scripts. And then we had our, our first, like, backstage promo. And I just assumed everybody's experience was like that. And then I found out later, like, no, they were really, they were really, really from day one uh, taken into us. They were really attracted to us and wanted us to be something successful. So that wasn't, like I said, the same experience that uh, other talents would have. Other talents would just show up and they'd be given their script with their – zero of their own input on it and say, this is what you're going to say, take it or leave it. Did you ever, and and by 2005, most everybody knew wrestling was a work, but you still have those crazy people. Did you get ever get like threats or things like that over the nature of the angle you were doing? You know, it's weird. It's like, no, no, we didn't. Um, I always tell this one story. The most real that wrestling fans ever got to me was actually when I was with Kali and uh, we squashed Rey Mysterio in San Diego, <laughs> in his hometown. And when we were leaving the place, people were banging on our cars and throwing, I don't know what they're, they're throwing shit at us and they cracked our windshield. And like, yeah, we're trying to pull out of the parking lot and people are rocking the car, almost tipping it over. And, and that was the most insane thing I ever had. And that had nothing to do with our, our hair, uh, not our hair, our, uh, our race. It just had to do with they loved Rey Mysterio that much and we killed him. But, uh, no, with me and Mark, in the arenas, they went a little bit further than, than most other talent. Like, they used to throw shit in the ring all the time and at, at you know, DX or whoever. But it, it's for the last few years it stopped. But we were kind of the first talents that got sodas and, and beers and, you know, popcorn and shit thrown at us while we were talking or performing in the ring. Uh, but once we'd left the arena, people were – if they bumped into us 90% of the time, they just wanted to – take a picture and, and have to sign an autograph or something. It, it never really, I never, maybe March has a different story, but I never felt any hostility uh, outside of the arena. And uh, last question, what do you remember about the Tokyo situation? I talked uh, at length with it uh, about Mark, about how he tried to make amends for the Eddie Guerrero deal. And he said he ended up picking up like a $2,000 bar tab and I spoke to Shane Helms, who said that he bought shots for some people, and some of those people just turned those shots upside down and poured them out. And yeah. that a lot of guys just kind of got out of there. They're like, oh, we don't want to be around this. Let's get out of here type of thing. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And Jericho was the one that grabbed me. Like they were, they were like I said, I was, I was there standing next to Mark. Like anything that he went through, I, I was there with him because, like, we were a team. We were, we, we were, you know, I was manager, not that that's a real title or anything, but he was, he was my friend. I should say that makes more sense than saying. Uh, he he really put you over as such, too. He said that you were the one with the, the head on your shoulders that would know what to do in situations like that, and that because of that, he probably didn't consult you before he said something to Eddie, or he probably wouldn't have ended up doing it. Yeah, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it was, like I said, we were, we were a great duo like we it was it was really two guys playing one character mark had the talent and the look and the promo ability to to carry his part and then i had just a little bit more experience a little more understanding of our industry uh and i kind of brought that to the table and if you wrap those two together 
you have just a package for success, and, and that's that's kind of what what happened. And and yeah, it's back to the the bar thing. That's exactly what happened. People were just dumping shots out on the carpet, just being assholes. Because you know, a hotel bar international, you're looking at twenty bucks, eighteen to twenty bucks a drink, and people are just racking them up, drinking some, dumping some, just really giving him a hard time. And I sat there with him just to support my friend. And I was saying, fuck it, you know, I, if I was there. The whole time, I probably would have chipped in on the bar tab, too. But I, I remember Jericho coming by and just was kind of like eyeballing. And Hurricane was there, too, and kind of was eyeballing the thing. But Jericho was the main event, dude. So he had a little bit more pull, I think, than Hurricane did. And he just kind of walked in there and kind of like slowly eyeballed everybody and just kind of was assessing the situation. And he just kind of grabbed my arm and goes, we're getting out of here. And then he just pulled me away. And then, you know, I didn't want to leave Mark, but, but you know, when when he, he, he pulled me away, I, I was new to the show. He was a, a main event guy that I, I respected and could learn from and appreciated him selling tickets for us and everything. So when he said, come, I he said, go, I got to go. So he, he just kind of saved my ass that night. And then, uh, and then just the horrible part was the next day I had to, you know, talk to Mark about it. And I felt awful for, you know, not being there to back him up. But, and I just felt like really shitty about the whole situation. I was like, this sucks. This is not, this is like our dream job. Like, it shouldn't be like this for you. Ironically, listening to a main event guy is what got him in that situation, which is, is kind of a shame. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, as, as Kurt Angle was, I don't know. Again, I don't know if the ignorance is the right word, but he thinks everybody's a Kurt Angle. You know, he thinks everybody yeah. has, that, has the same rights that he does. He, he's not aware that. There's a position on the car. There's a totem pole or a cast system that kind of have to work your way up. Uh, how long has it been since, since you spoke to Mark? Man, I don't know. Maybe five years, four years. I'm not. I'm not sure. Too long. I, and I don't even know why we stopped communicating. We still would text every once in a while, and then maybe I just got too busy with TNA and uh, Ring of Honor and stuff around 2010 uh, that we just kind of fell out of touch. But I'm not sure. Like. Like when he, you just said he's a vice president or vice principal of a vice, school now? Yeah, vice principal of a high school that's in great. New York. Last time I was talking to him, he was a high school history teacher, and then now he's VP. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. I wanted to ask you one more thing because I had spoken to Chavo about this. The feast or fired angle, that that was going to be how you were going to let go of TNA because Chavo was not. And as I found out, several people weren't aware of it before the angle. Sorry, can you say your phone cut out? Could you say that again? Yeah, uh, I was talking to Chavo the other day, and we got on the subject of the feast or fired angle and how he wasn't aware and how Christopher Daniels actually wasn't aware a couple times that they'd be pulled off TV after that angle or cut. Were you aware when you were in the match? So I'll, I'll tell you exactly. This is this is how this is a hothead I am. Is uh, we were going to do the feast or fired thing, um, and I don't know if you saw the match or not, but me and Cody Dino yeah. were both supposed to come down with the briefcase at the same time, and it was supposed to be a tie. The following uh, episode of Impact was going to be a live impact, and that was Hogan and Bischoff's first impact. And they were coming in with uh, creative control and stuff, and their, Eric Bischoff was going to be a producer on the show. So Terry Taylor said that, you know, we're going to come in, we're going to have a tie in the suitcase, and really Bischoff's going to decide whether or not he wants to keep us around or keep one of us around or both of us around, whatever, and we were going to have a match on the following live impact, and then the winner of the match got to stay, and the loser of the match got the losing briefcase. Um, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. The winner of the match gets the, you know, yes, that was right. The winner yeah. of the match gets, we were going to open the loser briefcase, and then we were going to back and forth, like, I don't want it, I don't want it, you won, you won, I won, and then, uh, and then we're going to have that match, and Bischoff was actually legitimately going to decide who he wanted to stay on the show. And then I was so mad and so frustrated that even that was like a question. Cause I just signed a new contract with them and I was so fucking pissed. And I'm like, I just, we just negotiated this new contract for months. We finally got it executed after you guys were dragging your heels in the mud. I was like, fuck this. Just give me the goddamn briefcase. I'm fucking, it's my last night. If you're not going to fire me, I quit. And let me open the briefcase and get the fuck out of here. I don't even want to wait to see Hogan and Bischoff. Just, this is my last night. And Terry Taylor was like, well, I got to ask Dixie about all this. And he went and told Dixie how pissed I was. And and then she was just like, fine, if he wants to go, let him go. And then the worst part was I thought I was somewhat or possibly saving Cody Jr.'s job, but ended up firing him anyways. So I was like, fuck, like, 
So I, I thought maybe I thought maybe if I left, I would save his job, but they just ended up firing him too. So it was, it was pretty shitty. Don't you think that's in kind of bad taste to work the guys backstage? Uh, I don't no, yes and no. It's it's what I'll t- I'll tell you what was more in bad taste was them not honoring a contract that they signed for me. That's in poor taste. That's a shitty type yeah. of you know business. I'll, I'll tell you an a awesome story about business ethics and how good WWE is. I just got a letter in the mail from them the other day that uh, said that apparently years ago they sent me a paycheck, like a good, like a really good sizable paycheck, uh, and apparently I never cashed it. This, this oh, wow. was like maybe 10 years ago or something. There was uh, uh, nine, eight years ago. I just got this letter in the mail that says, like, we have this on our payroll. We have this check that was cut and it was never cashed. And they're like, you know, it's it's yours. Like, where should we send it? And I was like, fuck, here's my address. Send it to me. And, like, I'm feeling that. <laughs> damn, like, that's that's such good business practice that they would notice that type of mistake. And not only notice it, but even – just they, they're going to make it good on it. They don't, you know, they didn't have to tell me that. They could have kept that money for themselves, but that's what they do. And then, like, I have to go to fucking TNA like every quarter and say, like, hey, I saw this and this DVD came out that I'm on. You guys use this and this footage on TV, and I haven't got a royalty check. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Well, we must have missed that or overlooked that. And then they'll cut you a check. Uh, sorry, sorry, I keep piling on questions. Uh, you mentioned WWE. Have they ever contacted you about WWE Network stuff? No, I I don't know how that works. Uh, I've never I never talked. I know I'm on there. Like if you type my name into the list, like I have some yeah. shit on there. But I don't know how the residuals work on that, or even if they do, or or I don't know when they do like new contents about who they need or what they want from it. Uh, have have they never asked you to like maybe be as a, like a guest on there? Like they'll have the retro shows and they'll have people talking about it. Like we'll see Hurricane or Vince Russo or somebody like that. I'm surprised they haven't tackled this storyline on there yet because, like I said, all things considered, it was one of the big, the hottest things I thought of the decade that the WWE did. It's really an underrated storyline and angle. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like I said, it was at since the Attitude Era ended, maybe like '99. I shouldn't even say the Attitude Era. It was like it was when WCW was kind of doors were closed and it was shut, like 2001. Once that was over, it was the hottest thing to happen. Uh, since 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 there was you know since WWE was the only game in town around like 2002, once all the dust settled on the invasion shit like, and WWE is now just a, a brand in its own. There's no you know these are our characters. There's no competition. Blah blah blah. It was the hottest thing that happened at that time. Um, I don't know what's happened since. I really don't watch the show too much anymore. But I don't know if stuff has happened that have been just as hot since then. I think probably the closest thing would have maybe been that Nexus angle, but that kind of fizzled out as well. But yeah, it was um, it was a, it was a fun ride, and it was something that I don't know if ever it could be replicated or duplicated, in there, or something that definitely left a sour taste in my mouth for the rest of my career when I did shit that wasn't as good. But I still love wrestling, so I didn't mind. But I always try to match that that pinnacle of success, or try and match that pinnacle of entertainment or attention span from the audience, and I could never really get there whether it's in TNA or Ring of Honor or now in Lucha Underground. But um, I just hope that I can be a part of something that good again uh, and, and that the audience will like it as much as I enjoy performing. So are you on this, the next season of Lucha Underground? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I cool. can't tell you awesome. in what capacity. You're hey, that's, hey, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. I'm, 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 I'm really excited. I have for the next two seasons. Cool, cool. I, bit, I spoke to uh, Krista Joseph and – Chavo to promote it. Really excited for that. I've been sharing that awesome recap video they put out. Uh, Matt Stryker, man, that that's awesome. So before we go, do you have any merchandise stores, upcoming appearances, projects, anything like that you want to want to get out? Yeah, I mean, just just if you can mention, you know, I'm, I'm still accepting bookings on shondavari.com. Uh, you could go on there and get a hold of my agent, and uh, I'm doing independent shows and seminars and, you know, training camps all over the country and stuff. And, and another thing I want to promote is season two of Lucha Underground starting soon. Um, yeah. I know they have the mini marathon of season one coming up. That's where you can see all the stuff I've done so far. And then starting season two, uh, you know, see where my character goes. I think it starts next week, maybe two weeks or something. Yeah. Two Wednesdays from now, the 27th, I believe. Yeah. Wednesday, yeah, the 27th. Tune in on the 27th and you can catch me on Lucha Underground.